Good. Good. Right. Good yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about profiling. Um, I'm John Linford, ARMS Director for HPC Engineering. Profiling software is my roots. So decades ago, um, the first one of my first things I did as a grad student was I went and worked um, at the ULIC Supercomputing Center for a little while on um, something at that time that was called um, Kojak, and shortly after became um, uh, Scholaska and Score-P. Um, and then some of the code I wrote are in there has been floating around um, those projects for a little bit. Then I went and worked for Paratools, uh, worked on Tau for a while, created something called Tau Commander that's still, I think, in use at a couple of national labs. So profiling is where I come from. I never actually worked at Alenia. Uh, for people who know uh, the story of Alenia at ARM, you'll be surprised to hear I've never been there. In fact, Alenia was a competitor of mine for most years. Uh, but this is my world. I, I have been doing profiling for longer than I'd like to admit. Um, and it's something I really enjoy. So talk about it a little bit today. Uh, what's on the menu here? I mo wrote most of these slides on a lunch break, so you'll notice a theme. Um, I wanna start with a basic methodology. This is stuff that's true about profiling, regardless of what tool you're using, regardless of what system you're on. Um, I've, I've used this on everything ranging from the Motorola-based computer in my Toyota Sienna up to airborne radar systems to supercomputers on the top 10 of the top 500. It works everywhere. Then I'm going to take a look at how do you actually do this with Reframe. I think that's what most of the people here really care about is, yeah, yeah, yeah profilers are cool, features are great, but I'm on a time budget. Show me how to get an answer now. This is a hackathon, darn it. Um, so that's what I'll do. And then after I've shown you that, uh, you can stick around for the rest of the talk where I'll explain more about uh, ARM's Forge tool and the map profiler that's part of Forge and the uh, performance reports tool that ships with it. So you can get a little bit more out of those tools. Um, they're installed and licensed for the whole event here. So it's right there at your fingertips. And then I don't have time to go into this today, but you have the slides. And um, if you want to, there's a case study of IO profiling and tuning with map at the end of the deck. So Go have a look at those. All right, <clears throat> methodology. So the first step in profiling is don't profile. Um, before you go and try to profile your application, definitely make sure that your application compiles and runs and gives you the right answer. There's a temptation, especially when you're in a time crunch, to just throw the profiler on it and throw it at scale and let's just get everything going right, right now, 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 now. And if you do that, you'll waste more time than you save. Um, I, I know this from far too many hands-on experiences. The best thing to do is make sure you can run this thing at a, re a representative scale, save a copy of those results somewhere so that you have a gold standard to compare against when you start profiling things. Profilers sometimes um, reveal strange and surprising bugs in the code that nobody even knew were there until you started pushing a little bit with the profiler. So it's always a good idea to have that gold standard. Definitely track how long an unprofiled run takes to complete. The wall clock runtime of an unprofiled run is your baseline metric for profiler overhead. So you're going to need that piece of data to tell you if the profiler has dramatically slowed down your application. Um, some profilers by design do slow down the application quite a lot, many orders of magnitude. Um, there are profilers that will slow down your code by 100x or 1000x even. But those profilers are generating metrics that are not dependent on wall clock time, so that slowdown doesn't matter. Map and the profilers I'll talk about today, they do uh, describe your wall clock runtime in code regions. So if you see dramatic slowdowns, by which I mean slowdowns of greater than 10% on your wall clock, uh, there's a problem here. And so you need to know what an unprofiled run looks like before you start profiling. All right, so once you've done all that, you've got a good sense for how your code runs and compiles and you know what good looks like, it's time to pull out your profiler. So let's, let's take a look at how do we identify and resolve performance issues. This is a general high-level methodology for approaching performance engineering of, of really any application at any scale. Start by taking a profile of the application. And I don't care what, what tool you use. Use a tool that uh, is good for the metrics you care about. Now, what metrics do you care about? Well, you can think about an application's performance as a composition of oh, hello? Oh, I think I got some noise there. Um, you can think about an application's performance as a composition of, of different um, performance characteristics. So 
Uh, roughly speaking, you could say it's composed of file I.O., communication, memory, and compute characteristics. And what I would strongly encourage you to do is focus on one of these characteristics at a time. Don't uh, you know, try to optimize uh, file I.O. and memory access at the same time. If you can avoid it, try to split these out. The reason for that is you, you want to be able to quantify the improvement that you've made in your changes. So you want to be able to say concretely that, yes, I changed the way these files are being written, and it had this much performance improvement. I changed the layout of this data structure, and it has improved performance by this much. If you do both at the same time, it's very hard to say what actually helped your application here. Um, or even worse, if you get very creative and you, you dive straight into um, a region and you do all the optimizations at once, and it suddenly got slower, you don't know if that's because three out of the five optimizations were a good idea and two of them were catastrophically bad. You really have to take it one at a time. So identify a hotspot in one aspect of the performance. Use a tool that describes that aspect of performance. And then focus optimizations on that aspect. So for file I.O., you could do things like um, file buffering, uh, look at the data format that you're using, especially at larger scales. You know, you might be okay writing out one text file per MPI rank for 64 ranks, say, but then you run at uh, you know 32k cores, and suddenly your application is doing nothing but open and close files all the time. You need a parallel file system at that point. So that would be one one of the optimizations you might approach. Once you're satisfied that you've improved performance in that aspect to a certain degree, um, go back, profile again to quantify your gains, and then go move on to the next X aspect of performance. And I suggest doing them in the order of file I.O., communication, memory, and compute. And the reason for this is I've, I've seen in the real world that if that aspect of performance is done badly, you get a certain slowdown. So in my experience, if you do file I.O. badly, you can absolutely get a 50x slowdown in your application. I'm not saying that optimizing your file I.O. Will, will speed up your application by 50x. I'm saying that if I wanted to break your application, the first thing I would do is break your file I.O. Similarly, communication. If you've got a lot of um, synchronous MPI calls, a lot of large, um, a large collectives, you know, look at those. Are those really necessary? Those things tend to be a bottleneck on scalability. Uh, it's hard to overlap communication and computation with synchronous communications. So uh, consider doing things like uh, non-blocking communications and, and to try to improve performance there. Again, only do this if you see that MPI communication is a significant fraction of the runtime in the profile. Um, if it's not, go ahead and move on to memory optimizations. The um, difference in, in performance between CPU uh, cores and memory is, is well documented and has been talked to death at this point, so I'm not going to cover it. But essentially, you're going to get a lot more performance out of optimizing your memory accesses than you ever will out of forcing a loop to vectorize, for example. In fact, I argue that vectorization is a symptom of a healthy memory architecture. So if you're getting good vectorization, it means that you're, only, you're really getting it because your data access pattern uh, is, is a good one, and, and things are well aligned for the compiler to you take advantage of those vector instructions on the memory access pattern that you've defined. So let's let's dive into some details here. Um, first question I usually get when people see this is, you know, <clears throat> oops, sorry. Let's see if PowerPoint can catch up. Right. Yes. So again, potential slowdown if this aspect is done badly. First question is usually, do I really need a profiler? Um, the compiler, for instance, is telling me that all of these loops have not vectorized. Isn't that a clear indication that my vectorization is broken and I need to go fix vectorization? Um, or maybe I'm the code expert, right? Uh, you know, I've, I've done 30 years of atmospheric physics and I can swear left and right that this thing is going to perform exactly in such and such a way. Do I really need to go profile that? Um, so yeah, here's a, here's a flow chart that will help you decide if you need a profiler. Uh, yes, you do. You really do. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a story time on, on why, as an example. Um, so this is going back to a GPU hackathon that was organized by Oak Ridge and held at the Posi Supercomputing Center some years ago. And I was working with this guy, Igor Bray, who's the head of physics and astronomy down at Curtin University. Very smart guy, top of his field, 
absolute expert in the code we were looking at. In fact, this code for quantum mechanics that we were, we were considering uh, was written by him and his students over a number of years. So really, he knows the thing absolutely inside and out. And our goal was to get it to run at very large scales on this GPU accelerated Magnus supercomputer. It was XC30, I think. And we started with initial profile of map. Now, when you, when you take a profile with the uh, map tool, you get a window that looks a bit like this. So it's a, it's a graphical tool. It will draw these nice charts that show you uh, performance in different code regions. And the, one of the strengths of map is when you open the tool, you get performance at a glance. So I can see very easily by um, looking at this window, what was the performance of Igor's code at, over time? Uh, if you focus on that top bit, the bit with gray and, and green, the green is, is uh, computation in OpenMP parallel regions. The gray is OpenMP synchronization functions, so OpenMP barrier, for example. And um, to me, I, you know, I open this up and I can see, oh, right, um, you know, there's a lot of time spent in OpenMP compute. That's good. It feels like barriers are taking a really long time to complete. And so I look at this and I think, um, you know, maybe we should start by optimizing open and barriers. Well, Igor looks at that and I, I true story, he, he looked at this for about 30 seconds and he says, wait, that's weird. Um, that first green blob there is the same size as the second green blob, but the first one should be a lot sh shorter. That function call should be a lot faster than the second one. And so the, the important thing here was he, uh, you know, in, in two minutes or less, could tell exactly where time was being spent in his application. Um, we were running, by the way, at um, 192 compute nodes, I think. Um, so uh, sev several hundred cores uh, and, and several hundred MPI ranks. And at a glance, he realizes there's a problem with this profile. Now, the other thing MAP will let you do is drill into the timeline. So. We take a good look at that first green blob. And, and if you're wondering how you actually do this, I'll get into the details later. Uh, for now, just focus on the fact that it can be done. We take a look at that first green blob and, and we see that almost all the time in that region is being spent in this get ch info call. So Igor tells me that get ch info applies an operation to columns of a matrix on a range. Basically, you say, you know, from column X to column Y, operate on these columns. And the first invocation of this function is supposed to operate on only one column. So that first green blob is meant to be essentially get ch info xx, so just for one column. But the weird thing is the second invocation is from x to y. It's for all columns of the matrix or most of the columns of the matrix. Somehow calling this function on one column was taking as much time as calling it on the entire matrix. So this is clearly wrong. Um, what is going on? Now, the second thing you'll notice in this picture of the map GUI is there's a source code window in the middle. Map will let you click through your source code as you're looking at the profile and, and navigate the source code and find which line of code uh, is spending a lot of time. So from here, we just start clicking through the source code for get ch info, and we really quickly came across a line of code um, with a very small bug, there was one line of code where instead of iterating um, from A1 to some upper limit, it was A for the entirety of A. And what this was doing is instead of, instead of uh, operating on one column of the matrix, because of this bug, because we left out two bytes in the source code, uh, we, we were operating on the entire matrix and then throwing away everything except for the one column that we cared about and returning that one column. And this is why it was taking so much time regardless of what limits you set. So all we had to do was change that one little piece of code and suddenly we got an incredible speed up. We went from this first call of get ch info taking almost 40% of the application runtime. It went down to something like 5% of the application runtime. Another interesting thing about this story is the, um, the, the way that the different code paths through this code uh, depend on a load balancer, which takes as input the number of MPI ranks. This bug never manifests at small scale because the code path with this um, error in the array limits uh, is, is never chosen unless you have a large number of MPI ranks. 
So Igor is on record as saying, you know, we never could have found this if we hadn't used MAP. Uh, we, we test at small scales, everything looks great. Then we throw it blindly on the whole supercomputer and suddenly we're tripping over this enormous bug that's slowing us down and we didn't even know. So this was a clear win for MAP. All right, so our takeaway here. Um, first, as you're working on these applications in the hackathon, talk to the experts. Uh, when I saw that profile, I thought we need to work on OpenMP synchronization. Igor saw the profile and said, there's something wrong algorithmically. And, and he was right. And we got a lot of speed up from that. So there are experts in the, on the mentors channels in the Slack. Um, there are experts in the communities for the codes you have been assigned. Just go ask them, you know, we, we've, we've run this thing. Does this look right? And a lot of these guys have invested a significant fraction of their waking hours into these codes. They will be elated to hear from you. So don't feel, don't be shy. Just go talk to the guys and, and connect to them. Um, if you're an expert and you think, uh, you know, I wrote this code, uh, I know everything about it. Or maybe, you know, I am the, the king of plasma physics. I know everything there is to know. I don't need no stinking profiler. Yes, you do. Um, go profile your code. Even if you think you know exactly what's happening inside there, you might discover you're like Igor and there's a secret bug way off on a code path that didn't ever get exec executed before. And it can come back and bite you and you won't see it unless you use the profiler especially in an environment like this, where we have multiple architectures, multiple math libraries, multiple compilers, you're going to be straining these codes in ways that they're not normally strained. So do use a profiler. <clears throat> um, try to compare knowns to unknowns. In our example, I'm comparing a call of a function with two different types of parameters. So get ch info with xx and get ch info with xy. By comparing those, Igor could see that there's an error. In our case, you know, you might want to compare what you consider to be a gold standard on one architecture with a gold standard on another architecture. Um, try to find some ground truth and then compare back to that as you profile out so that the moment something goes wrong, you can see it. And then instead of uh, taking small scale performance and extrapolating it out to expect what large scale performance might look like, I would suggest doing a high level lightweight profile at scale if possible, and then zooming in on the code regions you care about. So um, I, I know that a lot of teams work like this and it, it's a valid methodology to extract a, a microkernel of some kind, optimize it to death, put it back in the application and then scale that out. That, that does work. Um, but if what you're trying to do is, is rapidly improve the performance of a given workload, start with a high level profile to find the bottlenecks and then work on those individual bottlenecks. That usually gets you to success a little, a little bit quicker. All right, so hopefully at this point you're saying, all right, all right, already. I'll, I'll use a profiler for goodness sakes, just exactly how do I do that? So let's talk a bit about profiling with Reframe. <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, cover four different profilers here. They, these are all lightweight profilers, meaning I wouldn't expect them to extend your runtime um, by more than about 10%. Uh, they should complete quickly. They should have be low overhead, um, shouldn't really disrupt the, the application workflow in any way. And um, to, uh, at least one of these is practically omnipresent. Just about every Linux installation everywhere has some kind of, of perf. And it's a good tool for measuring hardware performance counters, mostly on single thread codes. Now you can use it on MPI codes and codes with large numbers of threads, but it's not really designed for that. And it, it gets a little bit creepy really quick. Um, so if you're working with a lot of MPI ranks, better to use something like um, MAP or MPIP. So before you go and, and dive into these profilers, run through a couple of uh, quick checks. Uh, this is just for this hackathon. This is very specific to this event. I'm not talking generally anymore. This is really just for the next three days. Um, first, make sure that you've added the extra ARM repo. You're going to need this so that you can uh, install and load the ARM Forge module. Uh, but because of the way ARM Forge is distributed as a commercial product with licensing, um, we can't grab it from SPAC generally. So what we've done is built a little, actually, I should give Ollie the proper credit here. Um, Ollie's built us a package that will sort of wire in the, the global Forge installation and take oh, care of John, all just to yep. Just to correct you live, no, not at all. Um, so ARM Forge installs 
from SPAC directly. It does? Yep. So and what do we need what do we need this for? Uh, this brings us perflibs. Oh, this is the perflib tools repo. Uh, yeah, it, it brings uh, ARMPL, uh, ARM compiler for Linux, and perflibs tools. Cool. Um, so yeah, SPAC supports ARM Forge automatically, and that was the fine work of Nick. Um, and basically, as part of the installation process, SPAC asks the user for the license file and oh, okay. installs it and populates it correctly. Did we not so, install this for everybody already? Uh, yeah, so that, that's already installed and available for users to use. Um, it's defined as an external package. Um, okay. And it's available on both the x86 and the ARM clusters. Woohoo! Oh, great. Winning. Okay, that, that makes things simple then. Um, you can install um, uh, MPIP with SPAC as well. So, and, and Ollie, you're saying the only thing that wouldn't work here if you didn't do the extra ARM repo is the perflib tools. Is that right? Correct. Okay, okay. So I misunderstood. I thought that Forge came from this, this special repo. Um, that's good news. So it's better supported than I thought. Um, moving on. So if you want to use um, MAP and the performance reports tool, there's a great uh, guide here in the Git repo that'll walk you through um, how MAP gets invoked from Reframe. And um, yeah, you could either um, run a perf report after the fact, like I'm showing here, or you could wire that into your Reframe script to actually get a nice little perf report afterwards. Again, if you're wondering, what is this MAP? What is this perf report? I'm going to deep dive on those tools in a moment, so you don't have to, to think about it too much. These are just good tools. This is how you use them. Um, an interesting thing, uh, about something at least I thought was interesting, is you have to put the map command in front of your srun command or your MPI run command um, in reframe. And so the way to get that done is you, you use this launcher wrapper class, uh, like we've shown here. Um, this is the whole of the code clipped straight from the from the uh, guide. So um, it's really not very scary at all. It's pretty easy to add profiling back to your, your reframe recipes. Uh, another tool is your humble perf command. So perf, like I said, is really designed for more single, single process workloads. Um, when you start doing multi-process things, you have to think about output files and you, you can do it. it. It can be done, but it, it's not really a first class use case for this tool, I think. Um, probably the easiest way to use perf in uh, reframe is to change the executable name. Um, this is this is hacky, uh, but again, you're just you know if you want to get it done, this is a good way to do it. Then you're going to get performance data for each MPI rank appended to the output for the job. Uh, if you're familiar with perf, you'll know that there's things you can do with perf record and output files where you change the name of the output file based on some process ID which you can get from MPI. I, it gets complicated. My point is don't deal with all that when you can probably get the same information or better from a tool like MAP or, MAP or MPIP. Uh, if you're on a single threaded code, this is, this is a pretty solid option. Uh, MPIP. MPIP is a fun tool because it shows you um, MPI communication. Um, it, that's the, the first class data that it, it generates is all about point to point and collective MPI communication. It does this by intercepting MPI calls at link time. Um, both uh, MAP and MPIP have these uh, dynamic objects that get loaded when the application is loaded into memory or when you link it, if you're doing, for example, a statically linked application. Um, and, and so the linker actually intercepts the call to something like an MPI send, replaces it with a call to a wrapper function that comes from this library. And then the wrapper function tracks the parameters to the function um, keeps a, a track of all the, the performance metrics around that, and then um, invokes the original MPI send that you wanted to do in the first place. To implement this in Reframe, all you have to do is change the srun job launcher options to set the LD preload environment variable. If you're not familiar with LD preload, this is a, a piece of the Linux um, uh, LDD, the magic Linux loader, basically, where you uh, can say when a program invokes a function, um, if it's a dynamic function, don't go back to the library that the, the executable is originally linked against. Um, first, try this library. And then if that library doesn't have it, go back to the library that it was originally linked against. 
I'm sure there are compiler experts and link experts out there that are squirming to hear me explain it so blithely, but that's the basic mechanics of how this works. Um, don't worry about it too much. Just go put this bit in your refra reframe file and, and you'll get MPIP profiles. Um, both MPIP and MAP rely on debug symbols and the executable. So make sure that you're building with the dash G flag. MAP will spell this out for you. If you get your MAP profile back, it'll have a very nice friendly message saying, hey, you know, this is your profile, but it's really hard for me to tell the names of the functions. I can tell that there's a function at this address and it's taking a lot of time, but I can't really tell you what source file it came from because you didn't have debug symbols. So go build your application with debug symbols. Don't worry about performance. Um, at building with a dash G flag will not impact the application runtime performance. You can still compile with full optimization and please do, do compile with full optimization. But um, you will also need those debug symbols if you want more information from MAP or MPIP. Um, the final tool is perflibs tool. Perflibs tool is a, um, a it, it shows you the, um, it, it's a bit like MPIP in that MPIP shows you when the MPI library is called. Perflibs tool shows you when math libraries are being called. So anything from the BLAS, LAPAC, or FFT libraries gets intercepted by perflibs tool. And then perflibs tool records the parameters that were passed to the function, the call site, things like this. So you can track what was my performance um, from a BLAS, LAPAC, or FFT uh, library. Just like MPIP, it relies on LD preload, so you can get it here. There's also a nice post-processing uh, script that will um, generate a, a good report for you here that Ollie's already wired into the perflibs tool guide. So again, just copy this blob essentially uh, and tweak it as necessary to get your profile. All right, um, more, a little bit more about map because right now I've just stuck to the high level. Map is, uh, the claim to cl fame for MAP is its scalability. It's designed to go out to many thousands of MPI ranks with each rank calling multiple open MP threads, um, sometimes hosting GPUs, could be using different communications um, libraries like um, OpenShmem, for example. There's a lot of different ways um, that you, you can talk between processes that MAP supports. It supports C, C++, Fortran, and Python. And, um, it's, it's a high level statistical profiler. So I'll give you a few cans and cans. Map can scale out to many processes with almost, with very, very low runtime overhead, right? Should be 5% or something, even with thousands of processes. The output files of map are, are very small. So it's lightweight on your file system. Um, one thing it can't do is separate down MPI ranks. So it's a statistical profiler that's going to look at um, the application performance sort of in aggregate across the whole run. Um, it's not, not possible um, by default to really drill into a specific MPI rank after you've taken your profile. Like I can't profile my code and then say, um, tell me what rank 32 was doing. Um, you can't, you there's a compiler flag, whoops. There's a compiler flag that will uh, let you single out MPI ranks excuse me, a profiler flag, not a compiler flag. Um, but once you've taken the profile, that information is more or less aggregated into a statistical picture and lost. So <clears throat> um, it'll show you bottlenecks. It really just points to where is the bottleneck. And then you can drill into that space as I did with the, uh, um, with the example from, with Igor and take a close look at that particular bottleneck and try to understand it better, maybe with a different tool. Couple of core features. So it's, um, like I said, designed to support C, C++, Fortran, and Python. It really just shows hotspots. So bottlenecks, places where time is being spent. It won't tell you if those things are good or bad, right? It just says where your performance is, where your code is spending time. It doesn't really say if the uh, performance is as expected. For this, you need to talk to an expert or take a closer look at the code or um, something like that. You know, you might, for example, notice that the time in MPI communication increases as the number of MPI ranks increase. Maybe that's just the way it is for this code. Maybe there's something you can do about it. Um, that, that might be a way you could improve the code. Um, but it, MAP's not going to stand up and say, you know, the way to make this code faster is 
replace MPI send with MPI I send. It, it doesn't really do that for you. It does measure hardware performance counters and it measures um, MPI calls and message rates. So you get a lot of data by de default, even though it's, it's an aggregate performance picture, you get some very valuable details about the um, hardware level performance of the application. Uh, in terms of hardware performance counters, you get a, a bit of a mix. Now, different CPUs have different capabilities. So don't be surprised when you run MAP on an x86 and the performance counters you get there are different from the ones on ARM. Um, they're neither better nor worse. You'll get different answers from different x86 cores. You'll get different answers from different ARM cores, different power cores. It's just the fact that CPUs are different. So um, MAP has predefined sets of hardware metrics that you can load up after the profile has been taken. And um, most of these are going to work on the Graviton 2 just fine. Try it out and see what sort of data you get. There are ways to use things like Pappy with MAP, um, but that's more advanced topic. So if you think you get to that level of detail, uh, you know, talk, to, talk to the profiling experts and we'll see what we can do. Now I said, you know, MAP doesn't really tell you if performance is good or bad. So something that can help with this is a tool called Performance Reports. Performance Reports will ingest a MAP profile and then come up with a very nice detailed report of how much time was spent in different aspects of your performance. So in this example, we can see that most of the time is being spent in MPI communication. And uh, Performance Reports at least thinks that the code is MPI bound. You should understand that performance reports is not infallible, right? If it tells you that your code is spending all its time in MPI um, and you should go optimize MPI, you know, that's just the performance reports analysis. The, the reality of this code might be that, that it just communicates a lot, right? If I put performance report on something like stream, which is a memory bandwidth benchmark, it's going to tell me that I'm spending all my time moving data around, which is true. But that doesn't mean I can go and somehow make these numbers faster by doing less data movement, right? That's the function of that benchmark. So, um, so consider the performance report as uh, an area to, to look at, not the final answer in why your code is slow. But there is a lot of data in here, especially when it comes to performance of OpenMP, uh, performance of MPI, and uh, performance of IO. So it's a good thing to use. <clears throat> it's also nice because you essentially get this report for free after taking the map profile. You uh, run map, get your high level statistical profile, and then you can take that file, input it into perf report and get this additional analysis that will advise on where to uh, focus your next op level optimizations. Um, I did notice that Things are spelled differently depending on how you load the, the modules. So watch out if you module load ARM Forge, there's no dash. But if you spack load, it's ARM dash Forge. Um, just if, if you're wondering why this doesn't work. In fact, that might be why I thought I'm realizing now. This is probably why I thought I needed the special ARM Git repo, because I tried a spac load ARM Forge and it told me it didn't exist. I'll bet I later added the repo and then did it with a dash. And that's probably why, how that happened. Um, use map dash dash help to see a lot of command line options. Um, same thing with performance reports. This will allow you to do things like zero in on a particular MPI rank that you might think might, you know, deserves a closer look. And a final word about the GUI. Now I keep showing these screenshots of the map GUI. There's a couple ways you can run this thing. Um, you can run it on the system where the code is actually running and then do something silly like forward X11 or use a VNC session. Uh, that does work. Um, you probably should run the client locally on your local laptop, whatever, it, or desktop. Now, um, there's a link here in a moment that will show you how to go and download that Forge remote client and install it. And this gives you uh, two options. The first is you can copy the map files from the remote system to the local system and then open them on your local file system. But what's even better is you can actually connect the local instance of the GUI running on your laptop to the remote instance of MAP executing on the, the virtual system. And if we have time here, I'll, I'll run through that if you like. Um, or you can just take my word for it that this does in fact work and I've tested it. <clears throat> and 
the reason I say doing VNC or remote desktop or something like that is silly is because the amount of bandwidth you'll need to connect the local instance of the GUI to the remote map instance is shockingly small. So um, for fun, I was on a flight over the Pacific and I, using the airplane Wi-Fi, decided to pull up uh, Forge and remote connect to a supercomputer um, down in North America. Um, I think I was, I was somewhere uh, uh, west of Hawaii at this point. And, um, and, and it felt like I was logged in at the terminal in front of this lo local supercomputer, even with network statistics as horrifyingly bad as these. Uh, I was still connecting just fine uh, to the local super, to the supercomputer. So um, I would strongly recommend that that be the way you use the GUI before you try something like X11 forwarding or remote desktops. <clears throat> um, essentially, to install the GUI, just go install the GUI. Uh, click on this link, and there will be uh, packages for Windows, Linux, Mac OS. Grab the one you want. Make sure it's version 21.0. You do have to match the local GUI version to the remote map version. Um, you'll get an error message if you don't. If you get that error message, go back and fix the version. I can walk through the details of Remote Connect, but this is usually um, something that takes more time than uh, it's worth. And people will have to go do it again. And then they always ask me the same questions about the stuff I just showed them. So what I would suggest is if you are interested in using Map this way, install the GUI, click on the Remote Connect box, try to add a configuration. And if those fields aren't self-evident, um, send us a message. It's usually pretty straightforward. And uh, if you're hitting any issues, just let me know. We'll walk you through it. All right, so to wrap this up, I uh, want to reemphasize, do use a profiler. Um, don't assume you know why your code is slow, especially don't think you know, that you have to force some loop to vectorize. I see that happen all the time at these hackathons. Somebody obsesses over a compiler auto vectorization message that says you know, this loop wasn't vectorized. Pretty much every time uh, a compiler decides not to vectorize a loop, it was the right decision. And forcing it to vectorize is going to hurt performance. It's better to take a look at the whole application, look for the bottlenecks, focus on those individual bottlenecks, and try to resolve them before you deep dive on some auto vec message. Um, you can go see guides on how to use these profilers with Reframe. Uh, I think they're all very straightforward and, and easy. And they're also a good starting point for using tools like SCORE-P, Tau, uh, Scholastica, Liquid, probably. I haven't actually tried Liquid with Reframe here, but um, you'd, I, I'd be surprised if it didn't work. Um, get a, take a good look. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, uh, there are slides following this that will show you how to do an IO optimization exercise with, with uh, MAP. So you're welcome to go read those on your own time and, and ask me any questions. But I think that leaves us just about at the end of time. Is that right, Booth? Oh, I think it's about it. And we will put these, we'll put these slides. Ollie's been collecting the slides and we'll put them into, uh, you know, the GitHub repo so everybody can find them. So find those awesome. extra slides. But yeah, it's the end of time is there, but you know, we can, we can hang around and ask questions. If people want to jump and go keep hacking, please do. But if you, you've got questions, hang around and uh, talk to John. Assuming John doesn't have another meeting he has to run to. Nope, I'm good. <laughs>